This Relay Radio podcast is brought to you by Brett Young. Change the game with BY7204LL, Brett Young's newest canola hybrid with Liberty Link technology. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Friday edition of the show. Thanks so much, everybody, for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, of course, big shout out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. It is Friday, which means we've got a, we've got a Real Ag Issues panel today. It's going to be a good one. We've got Parliament returning with the Federal Reserve dropping uh, their interest rate by 50 basis points. We've got trouble in the prairies when it comes to grain companies, Northwest Terminals shutting down their operations. We've got India extending a tariff-free period. Cereals Canada makes some progress on farm groups funding their gate project. Lots happening. We're going to get to as much of it as we possibly can with today's panel. We'll be joined by Lindsay Smith and Kelvin Hefner of Real Agriculture. We've also got Marvin Slingerland here. He is the new Senior Vice President of Agriculture for MMP. He's based in Lethbridge, Alberta, and he'll join us today as well. If you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also uh, find Real Agriculture across all the different social media platforms. You're also more than welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line. Now, that number is 855-776-6147. And speaking of feedback, keep the feedback coming. Yesterday on the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada, we had a really good discussion with all of our farmers and ranchers about social media, smartphone use when it when it comes to our kids. And I mentioned I was reading this book uh, talking about uh, maybe we need to be, have a little bit more restrictions on kids' access to things like social media uh, based on age, similar to we do when it comes to voting or being able to buy tobacco or alcohol products. There's age restrictions in place in both Canada and the U.S., now, you know, province to province, that age changes. Uh, the U.S. is 21 kind of across the board, but there's restrictions in place. Do we need to have it when it comes to smartphone and social media use? Now, in some schools in different provinces, there are restrictions. You can't have your, your, your phone. You can't use it in the classroom setting. Does that need to go further, even at home, even when they're on the playground? Well, I want your perspective on it. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. It was interesting. Some mixed opinion by the farmers. Some saying, I don't like to be, no, no, I don't like that idea. Of, you know, let the parents decide. And some are like, yes, this is critical for the safety of kids. This needs to happen. Give me your perspectives. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll get rolling with the Real Ag Issues panel right after this. Advanced canola trait technology is here. And it's soon to be the talk of the town. Optimum Gly delivers excellent yield potential and agronomic trait performance. Improved crop safety. Enhanced weed control. And a wider window of application. You're going to want to see this. Learn more at OptimumGly.ca time for a product spotlight with the Canadian Canola Growers Association. We're joined now by Dave Gallant. Who is CCGA and why are we talking about Cash Advance? Well, the Canadian Canola Growers Association has been around for 40 years. The Cash Advance program itself has been around for over 50 years. It gives farmers access to cash flow for their inventory without having to sell. Big benefits of the program, the first $250,000 this year is interest-free and CCGA offers the program on over 50 different products. So we do all the grains and oil seeds, livestock, so cattle, bison, hogs, goats, as well as honey. This program you only pay as you deliver your product. So there's no monthly payment scheduled. You pay when you have cash flow from your product. And the third big advantage, the only collateral, especially at this time of the year, is the grain itself. How, how do they learn more? How do they get started? Well, the easiest way is you can go to ccga.ca. 
If you really want to understand it, you can call us at our 1-800 number, 1-866-745-2256. Real Lag Radio here on this Friday. Hey, for agronomically effective dual UAN inhibition, the smart answer is Tribu Nitrogen Stabilizer from Coke Agronomic Services. To learn how its two active ingredients protect UAN from three forms of nitrogen loss, you can visit CokeAg.ca. Two active ingredients taking care of three forms of nitrogen loss. I love it. Coke Egg. Dot C-A. Let's bring in the panel up first. It is Lindsay Smith coming out of Ottawa, Ontario. Lindsay, how are you? Uh, well, um, sweaty. I'll be honest. We have had uh, almost 10 days, well, yeah, at least that, of incredibly hot, dry weather. It hasn't rained. Uh, the only saving grace has been it has cooled off a bit overnight, but it feels like mid-July. And wonderful. I was no, not wonderful, Sean. I am ready for pumpkin spice lattes and sweater weather gross. and fall colors. Not gross, amazing. And instead, we're like full on summer. So, second summer. But but we heard uh, Matt Macon on the radio show earlier this week uh, from Matt Macon's weather and could be cold this winter then then you'll be in your happy place when the snow's flying <laughs> yeah that's right so we are and we're probably going to talk about this uh a, a little bit further with la nina developing um that means apparently for ontario that means a colder than average and quite snowy winter so and not necessarily a lot of snow accumulation just many snowy events which means gray and yucky so uh i gotta soak in all the heat i guess and just Bite my tongue. Yeah, it's okay. one of the big differences between a Eastern Canadian winter and a West in one, one of the prairies. We see the sun in the prairies, mm. which uh, I think yeah. is uh, a little less gloomy. Also joining us is Kelvin Hepner, coming out of uh, very wet Manitoba. Kelvin, what is Mother Nature dropping this week? It, there's been some insane weather events. Yeah, up to eight inches of rain in some parts of southern Manitoba here within a, a couple of days. So uh, there are a lot of soybean and edible bean fields that uh, are struggling or could be a challenge to take off. Some standing can- or some canola is still in the field as well. So yeah, harvest is at a standstill and uh, there has been some communities with some flooding, road- roads washed out, that type of thing. So not so much about the temp- talking about the temperature around here this week, but uh, the sheer amount of, uh, of precipitation that we've seen. And did you replace that combine? Yes, we did actually. Last week we uh, we picked up another replacement model at it at an auction sale, and uh, so we're ready to go when when the fields are dry enough again. And I, and I heard you bought a replica, like an exact replica <laughs> of the previous one that you had. <laughs> Is this we, well, true? That's- not exactly the same, but yes, it's an we're we we still run ninety six John Deere ninety six hundreds here, and I appreciate. I should also say thank you to our listeners yeah. who sent me dms and texts of 9600s for sale in their area nice. uh, Love it. we found one a little closer to home than some of those but uh yeah we we picked one up and the the market has actually softened a bit on on that on those prices as well i guess with everything else coming down the dominoes have reached all the way down to the the oldest combine models in the market too so mm-hmm. yeah we have a a spare 9600 for parts now and one that one that works so mm-hmm. I just I had a scene from Entourage come on my head, a famous quote from Ari Gold, which I won't repeat here because we may be kicked off of rural radio, but it, it, it we'll talk about it during the commercial break. Also joining us right now is Marvin Slangerland. He is a senior vice president with MMP for Agriculture. Marvin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean, and looking forward to uh, to joining this panel. Yeah, so um Introduce yourself. Give us some of your background. You're you're, uh, you're in my stomping grounds of Lethbridge. Yeah, born and raised in the Lethbridge area. I grew up on a on a feedlot west of Port Macleod, which my uh, my parents ended up selling when I was in grade four. So, grew up as a town kid for for my school years, and then after after high school, I started working on a dairy farm for fifteen years and was a herdsman. And then at one point, I decided that this probably wasn't like a long time long time long-term career so went back to university and joined MAP in 2009 and um, haven't looked back and it's been a it's been a crazy ride and I consider myself to have one of the best jobs in Canada yeah 
Cool stuff. Well, welcome. It's great to have you here on the panel. Okay, let's dive into some of the issues. Um, I, I, I want to get to some of the news items first here in the in this segment. Northwest Terminal, Kelvin, is facing some pretty significant financial trouble. They have now. I want to get the verbiage right. There's suspended. There's revoked. There's rep- what exactly has happened? They're shutting their their operations down, and they've canceled their. Canadian Grain Commission license is that correct? And what does that actually mean? Yeah, that's what we're we're still digging into the details of what cancelled means versus uh, having it revoked. But uh, this means that they Northwest Terminal initiated it. This is a, a large farmer-owned grain elevator in Western Saskatchewan, one of the largest grain handling facilities on the prairies. Uh, it's run. It's basically a largely farmer-owned, owned by about a thousand shareholders, a majority of which are, are area farmers in Western Saskatchewan at Unity, and uh, and so they have been struggling financially. So they report their earnings publicly. And we, we have seen this over the last couple of years. They have been struggling financially. And this week, the board of directors made the call to suspend all purchases of grain. They are going to idle their elevator. And they have canceled their elevator license with the Canadian Grain Commission, as you mentioned, as of September 18th. They are continuing operations with their distillation. They have a distillery on site as well. That is going to stay in business and, and keep running. And they are at this point saying that the elevator is going to remain closed indefinitely until either uh, margins improve in the grain industry or the elevator is sold and they have engaged some uh, a strategic advisor to help them work on, on next steps. But yeah, I think this is something that is probably, we don't see the books of all grain companies, but I think this is something that is probably uh, an issue that a, a lot of the grain industry is dealing with. And we've seen closures on on the processing and more of the specialty crop side of things, on the pulse side of things. We've seen some closures there as well, and I think it all ties together here. Yeah, Marvin, it's kind of a, an example of, of the, it's... It's just not easy to make, you know, a lot of times as farmers, we're like, ah, oh, the grain company's making all this money. There are times yeah. where money is made, but it's sort of like the meatpacking industry. Margins are thin. Yeah, and it's a volume game, Sean, and it's it's really too bad to see this closure because it's just one less competitor out there for producers to, to work with and, and for the farmers who, who have invested as well. And, and it's really too bad, like, even as we see more, uh, more consolidation in the grain industry. It's it's too bad to to see this come across, and it seems to be a little trend this year with companies closing, like you mentioned, Calvin. And and hopefully, um, hopefully, there's a, a reboot and a restart and a different business model that can reopen this terminal. Yeah, 1,100 shareholders, and the majority of them being farmers. And you know, I think we're always pushing. I, I, you think about the pandemic. There was all this push for you know we need more competition in the processing sector. Now, that was, a lot of that was around uh, proteins, but I think it's always great to see farmer-started initiatives, but uh, it's, it's, it can be tough business at, 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 at times, for sure. Now, Lindsay, you also did some work this week on India extending their tariff-free time. Going, uh, They've extended it out to December 31st of this year. Uh, you interviewed uh, Greg Sherwick from Pulse Canada. What did we learn there? So, yeah, so really good news, uh, certainly from, uh, from India, that the extension was to end October 31st. So this was... Uh, peas could move into India tariff-free until October 31st, uh, and they extended that tariff-free timing until December 31st. So it does add a few weeks, of course, to the shipping season uh, where peas could potentially move into India. Uh, as you mentioned, Greg Cherwick with Pulse Canada, president there, um, he shared that, uh, you know, this really does have to do with food security in India. Uh, domestic prices have been through the roof, and it, it's a country that often will use tariffs to either uh, prop up prices within its own country or potentially to make sure that it can feed its own country. And so this is one of those times when India definitely needs some more pulses brought into the country. And so they're keeping uh, that tariff down to to zero until December 31st. Whether or not it extends further, yeah. whether or not, uh, you know, we see this continue uh, for an even longer time, that we didn't know. And uh, Greg promised that he'd get back to me after the special crops uh convention this week to find out if buyers were actively uh, going to increase the amount of peas that they'd be bringing into India. So we'll keep you posted on that one. 
He also mentioned they're hosting a delegation from India this yes. this week, right? Yeah, yeah he was going to pick up at the airport. Too. Yeah, he yeah. was a he was a very busy man this week, so I really do appreciate him taking time. Um, because he running was picking... Pulse Canada, he's a shuttle yes. driver. He's yeah, going, he was going golfing. Like he was going to try, but I think like, yeah, I think he got rained out. Um, but definitely, and I mean that is one of the things where the that special crops convention, Paulson special crops convention, a lot of international buyers and companies do attend, um, and a lot of business does get done at this at this particular conference. So um, I did ask the question, you know, will this lead to an increase, you know, of a substantial increase? Um, and at that point, he couldn't say, but he said um, that in last grain, like to, to July 31st, there was 800,000 tons of yellow peas that went into India. It's a significant amount. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and we've seen those tariffs. Uh, the deadline has been extended a few times now, so hopefully that keeps going. Yeah. 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 It, it and that's the problem is it's like it's not like in like longer lengths right like yeah. it's not like you know for the next five years we're good uh, it's like three months and six months and you know even if they said five years they could always change it right so but uh, this is definitely uh, again an example of having those people on the ground and the trade missions and all that work that goes into market development it all ends up looking for these kind of these kinds of outcomes it's not, it's not without hard work from the canadian side of the aisle to uh to 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 get these kinds of decisions that were favorable short term in nature but favorable and uh as greg had said in that interview from tuesday's show that Lindsay did you can't say it was expected like you just don't know especially with india right like i think the other countries and trade partners are a little bit more predictable China, or sorry, in, well, China too, but India, not exactly predictable. Okay, uh, we're going to take a, a break here, and we're going to be back with more. Parliament returned. We've got a lot to talk about there. Is the block the new NDP? We'll discuss when we come back. You're listening to Real Life Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. We got a product spotlight with Kate Hyatt, the marketing portfolio lead for DeKalb. Let, let's talk about the DeKalb Coat of Farms. Coat of Farms is an initiative to celebrate the partnership between DeKalb Seed and the farmers that are choosing it. The way that Coat of Farms works, it's a farmer-driven, artificial intelligence enhanced line of DeKalb swag. So it's an interface on an iPad or on your phone or your computer. You answer a series of questions that help drill down to what represents you. And then a 3D rendered jacket gets created. So how long does this go on for? That's a great question. So contest uh, runs from August 27th through to October 15th. After October 15th, there's going to be a contest where 10 of the coats will be available to be won um, through draws and by from the people that participated. That is great. DeKalbCoatOfFarms.ca And welcome back to Real Lag Radio. Hey, protect your anhydrous ammonia and bottom line. Even if temperatures hit below Lindsay's favorite, 15 degrees or below, that's too late to apply. That's not, sorry, that's not too late. Not too late to apply agronomically effective, non-corrosive Cinchero nitrogen stabilizer. Learn more at Cinchero. Dot C A. We got Lindsay Smith, Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, along with Marvin Slingerland of MNP. Okay, gang, Parliament's back in session. Kelvin, uh, what did we learn this week? There's a lot that happened. Um, what, what did we pick up on? When did the week start? I don't remember <laughs> which events were this week and what it, it's all blurring together. There's a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different things happening in Parliament. And I think overshadowing it all was the, the departure of the NDP from the agreement with the Liberals. And so a lot of uh, emphasis now on whether we'll see non-confidence motions, when we'll see them, whether they have a chance of passing. And so now the Conservatives, Pierre Polyev, uh, announcing that uh, they're going to introduce a non-confidence motion 
on Tuesday of, uh, of this coming week. And as soon as he announced that, the Bloc Québécois, who have incredible leverage now uh, propping up the Liberal government, said that they will not be voting non-confidence. So the government's going to stand through this vote. And shortly after, the NDP also said that they would not vote in favor of a non-confidence motion. And so I don't, I don't think either of those moves are surprising. The, the Bloc right now, uh, they have huge leverage, as mentioned. They also don't have an issue where the Liberals have really said no to them or where Quebec voters would be motivated to give them more seats where they'd want to go to an election and and potentially have to deal with a majority conservative government. Right now, the Bloc has a much better situation in Quebec in standing up for Quebec's specific provincial interests in a minority government situation with the Liberals in power. And why would the NDP support if the Bloc isn't? The NDP, if essentially, as soon as they play that card of voting non-confidence, they can't really take it back, and they want this Pharmacare bill that's in the Senate passed. And so I don't think this is a surprise. We're going to... Uh, but I, the Conservatives are going to continue trying these non-confidence motions in the in the coming weeks. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the tipping point will be where one actually passes at this point. Yeah, well, and how many times do you do it before it's like, okay, like we're wasting time, energy, and... Well, it's... To me, there's three scenarios, and this is also ties in with when we're going to have an election or whether we will have an election sometime soon. One is either the bloc trigger an election because they run into an issue where the liberals say, no, we can't do that for you. And it also helps their vote prospects in Quebec. So if the bloc could all of a sudden double their seat count in Quebec on an issue in an election, I think that's when they would trigger it. Another one would be that Trudeau gets tired of it all and just wants to uh, move on because he can see the writing on the wall. And the other, the third scenario that Pop came to mind this week, especially, is everybody was extremely on edge in Parliament this week. Tempers were high, tons Ooh, of confrontation, and name Spicy. calling, testy. And when people are seeing red, we don't always make rational decisions. And, and that's where I, it, it almost just made me wonder is somebody going to screw up here and, and make a poor decision just because they're so angry and personally upset and going to throw their leader under the bus or something like that where party lines break or or something somebody makes a decision just out of out of anger or spite that could potentially bring us into a, a non-confidence motion passing here too i guess so i don't know what do you guys think are those well, it, it, i think it's a definitely a possibility i was going to ask marvin you know I, I we're following this like the the blow by blow and we have a company group chat where we're all watching question period not all Canadians are watching questions. Or nerds. Yeah. And nor or do nerds. Recommend, or nor do I recommend it. But but Marvin, I think for the for the average Canadian, they're they're probably just a little bit like, just tell me when I gotta vote. Maybe like they're they're just not following the blow by blow of this. Or how how do you read it? I don't know, Sean. I think more and more people are actually following right now. I think um I, I get the sense that more Canadians are invested right now in what's going on in the country than say three, four years ago. And, and I think there's a real appetite now to to see see a change, and I'm very curious as well, Calvin, what's going to happen this fall. Um, like you even see the provincial government in Quebec pressuring the bloc to vote against right now because of provincial issues. So it could it could change really quick, really fast. Yeah, we had James Moore on the show on from Denton's on Wednesday. You know, and he referred to Quebec, you know, the rise of Quebec, Lindsay. So that that's mm-hmm. definitely something to uh, to uh, to follow close. Um, one of the requests of the block is they're thinking about two eighty two, and of course, remember this is the private members' bill that would basically prevent Canada from negotiating away any supply management market access in any future trade deal. Of course, that is all to do well for the most part, to do with uh, any potential renegotiation of the Kuzma agreement with the Americans. Lindsay, this is, this is, this is where it gets really spicy on the agriculture front. Yeah, so, and, and we have to remember, even in the context of leaders yelling at each other, question period being ridiculous, which, I mean, let's face it, it always has some theater to it, but it has been incredibly raucous this week. There's still other bills that have to eventually be introduced and voted on and discussed and all of those things. And a few of those include... 282, uh, also 234, which we're going to talk about, I'm sure, at some point as well. So, you know, Parliament will continue, uh, even with, you know, some of these squirrel moments and arguments, etc. And And so this does, actually, one of the things we maybe didn't talk about when Jagmeet Singh pulled the confidence or the agreement with the Liberals 
is just where it puts the block. And it does put the block, as we mentioned, in a lot of uh, a well-leveraged position. Let's put it that way. It does shift the power in the house as well. And because of that, we likely are going to see something like 282 have a much clearer path all the way through um, than we potentially would have seen prior. It does really open that up. What does that mean for our trade-dependent commodities? realistically, you know, on this show, I don't know that a Friday has passed that we haven't mentioned this looming deadline of 2026 with Kuzma or USMCA and what we should be doing in between then and and now as far as leadership, as far as relationships, as far as, you know, the chips that we can play. And this just throws a wrench into all of that in that it becomes a, a piece of legislation that if passed um, actually is going to have to be dealt with potentially with the next parliament yep. if we get a change in government and and all let's re, let remind everybody all parties supported this thing because they wanted to get it on the record that they supported supply management not necessarily thinking about the consequences if it actually happened and and and, and here we are because the, the the chess pieces have shifted the landscape has changed and maybe there's some regret in certain parts. And I, I'm going to play a clip for you. I did an interview with Jacob Shapiro of the Bespoke Group yesterday. And here's the... Poli- you know, we got a U.S. election. It's very consequential when it comes to C- Canada-U.S. relations. One of the things is he wasn't too sure if it really mattered for Canada, whether it was the Dems or the Republicans, that, that, that won because of the increase in the protectionist nature. So here's what Jacob had to say to different audiences lately is, look, no matter who wins, you're getting an ideological, demagogic populist who wants to blow out the government deficit and engage in protectionist economic policy. So like there's different varieties of that. And we could talk about whether a Trump administration is a threat to the republic or if, you know, a Kamala administration is a threat to uh, wealth with some of her crazy things uh, or some of her crazy policies that she's put out there that I, I don't quite understand. But at the end of the day, like these the the economic policies that these two parties are offering are actually not that different. They've converged on protectionism and America first. They just want to do it differently. Calvin, we have been talking about this a lot. Yeah, it's exactly. And this is Canada's concern in terms of 78% of Canada's exports last year went to one market, the U S our best friend, our ally, our neighbor, our, we share the longest border in the world, all those, all those things. And, And we have to, uh, yeah, as the U.S. government tilts more in this direction, and right now it looks inevitable, no matter who wins this fall, that's where we're headed. And so that's where, uh, bringing it back to Ottawa, the Canadian government needs to be doing its homework right now and needs feet on the ground, needs to be doing what it can to maintain that relationship, build that relationship, invest in, in things that enhance that relationship and in agriculture, we know this better than uh, than in many other sectors, even in terms of our uh, reliance on on export trade to add to Canada's GDP. We always forget we 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 talk about how we're we're exporting products and commodities to other countries. There's a benefit to all Canadians from that in terms of uh, the income that we bring back to this country for that, and and the tax dollars that are are paid for with that, and all all of that. So we we need to make sure that's part of all our political discussions here at home as well. And 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 Marvin. You know, I think Kelvin puts that really well, the importance of, of trade and the economic value it provides to Canadians. But, you know, we need to do everything we can, Team Canada times three approach or whatever it takes yeah. to 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 really try to secure and maintain a trade agreement like this. Not saying it's going away, but boy, I think there's going to be some rocky waters here between now and July 1st of 26. Yeah, absolutely, Sean. And, and I, this applies to all sectors, not even agriculture. Like, Ag is very dependent on U.S. trade, but even the auto sector, manufacturing, like it is a big deal for Canada, and 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 it doesn't help if our federal government is going through tough times right now either, because the focus is not on building those relationships; it's maintaining control in Canada, and and we might lose track of what what we should be doing. Yeah, I think they, that's the. I, it was funny. I was on Agri Talk this morning in the U.S., and we sort of had the same conversation. Nothing's happening in Washington. The eyes are yeah. not on the ball, and th- this is just kind of a common thing with government, right? Governments right now. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's getting done. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's kind of the way that we roll. Okay, we got to take a break. We've got more coming up here on Real Ag Radio. Uh, the big one I want to chat about is the Gate Project. 
received some pretty substantial funding this week from farm groups. Millions. And we're going to talk about it when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius X. Whether you're in a career within an organization, starting your own business, looking for your dream job, running your own farm operation, operating a company in ag or food, or want to hone your overall life skills, this conference is for you. Celebrating over 10 years of bringing women in ag together, join the Advancing Women Conference in Niagara Falls on November 17th, 18th, and 19th. Visit advancingwomenconference.ca for more information and to register. Peter Johnson at WheatPeteRealAgriculture.com. I'm the host of The Word, and I love doing The Word. I love the questions. I love the challenges. I love having to apply agronomics to all over the globe and areas outside of my normal jurisdiction. Also, I love the feedback the most where growers challenge me, tell me about their plot results, help me to learn. The Word, absolutely the best part of my day. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Friday. I, I think it's the last Friday of, of summer. I, I, is it's it the summer? Of summer, yep. That is fall gross. This Yuck. It's not gross. I thought fall was your favorite season, Sean. Only it things is, but, I, but I do like fall. But the problem is, is it's so close to winter, it's just hard to really, you know, <sighs> we, we, I have angst about it. And I, I, I just don't like. But Thanksgiving is in the fall, so that's right. Of course, the best holiday of of the year. You all know it. Some of you just aren't willing to admit it. But hey, I want to remind you of this. MMP as well wants to remind you that the initial deadline to submit your 2023 agri stability form without penalty is September 30th. That's coming up. That's in 10 days. Visit mmp.ca today to connect with an agricultural risk management advisor. That's an important deadline, there, Marvin. Yes, and next year is going to be June 30th, so even earlier. Ah, yeah. Plan really? ahead, everybody. Big change. Ontario's had June 30th for a long time, but uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba are switching to June 30th next year and Alberta the year after, so a little tighter deadlines. Okay. Well, and I, I, I hate forms and paperwork, so anytime I can get somebody to help me do some of that stuff, uh, all the better. So you should too. MMP.ca. Okay, let's dive in on a conversation that I had bef- before we move on to the Gate Project and Cereals Canada. I, I want to play a clip for you because it-, it really stuck out to me from my interview with James Moore from-, from-, from Wednesday. And we were talking about who supports Pierre Polyev versus who doesn't. And he brought up some information that I knew it was a thing, but I didn't know how substantial. So here's James Moore of Denton's. I'm a religious person, or I have certain values, or I believe in entrepreneurship, but I don't like high taxes, and I don't want my house broken into when I leave my home in the day. So, you know, Pierre is the only guy who speaks to them. So there's a, there's a, there's a center-right entrepreneurial sort of recalibration with young Canadians that's going on, and you see it in the numbers everywhere. It's, yeah. And I mean, I got I mean, yes, I'm a conservative and all that, but... I think it's I think it's really refreshing because like we've 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 had this sort of meme about young people for a long time that they're you know entitled and lazy and weak and soft and and all that. No, young Canadians are are aggressive and forward leaning and they want to succeed and they're not victims and they want to fight and and push and it's it's great to see. Interesting, Kelvin. What's your reaction to that? I think it fits with what we see in in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm not sure I knew that the polls were that strong. Where I, I think I'm not sure he mentioned it in that clip, but but elsewhere in the interview where he t- actually talked about the strongest support or strongest margin of support for Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives right now in in some polls is that younger demographic, kind of in that 20 to 30 age age range or 18 to 30. I guess if 18 you go down to the 35, voting age. he said they would have a definite okay. super majority if only that group voted. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, the Liberals and Justin Trudeau have been in power now for not nearly nine years. And so that is uh, that's a whole decade's worth of voters that have come into the picture. And and as as James Moore, the former conservative cabinet minister, n- noted there, uh, how's buying a house is a huge question mark for a lot of people in their 20s right now. And and that's something that we still consider pretty important to as to 
becoming an adult in Canada and, 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 ha- and, and house ownership is, is something that a lot of people place a lot of value on. And I think there's a lot of frustration there among, among this, uh, this demographic that we're talking about. So not really surprising. Maybe the extent of, of which that support is, is, has been measured is, is uh, interesting. And, and if Moore's right, I, I, I think it's awesome that we're seeing this entrepreneurial drive from young people. And you don't need to out anybody at the firm there, Marvin, but you, there's in any age group, there are high performers, there's duds, like there, and everywhere in, in between. I think sometimes we maybe pick on the young people a little bit. We, we sort of show some ages in once in a while and pick on the young people too much. Yeah, sometimes you do, but I think this next uh, generation is actually quite motivated, Sean. And um, and my son spent a year in the Hill three years ago. He worked in Ottawa for a year. And he told me already three years ago that the tide is shifting and more and more young people are attaching themselves to the Conservative Party. And primarily for the reasons you mentioned, Calvin, anybody who's young wants a house, wants a good job, wants to grow a family, buy food. And those are the things that are important to them right now. And, and they just want to, want to achieve something. And it's really interesting to see how that tide has shifted so quick. Yeah, it, it's, it's fa- kind of fascinating to me. It all makes a lot of sense. Lindsay, go ahead. Well, so I wanted to, it's also, there's a broader sort of shift in here. And we've been talking about it this week too on, uh, Calvin, I think he's shifting of the poles, let's say of, of different poles of the, you know, the south and the north, the, the left and the right on groups that we maybe associate being very supportive of the right, uh, perhaps moving to the center or left or the left move, voting to, to the, the right as the by-election in Winnipeg was not between the NDP and the liberals or the NDP. It was between the conservatives and the NDP and they were the strongest candidates. And it was, you know, so the conservative candidate is a union guy. That's not necessarily usually what we see. So we are seeing, I think, uh, not just generational differences, but even just sort of backgrounds and where we have seen sort of groups or, or you know, groups of people that typically align with one side or the other have also potentially shifted. Um, and that, you know, at least on the Canadian side, but we're seeing it in the U.S. too. But on the Canadian side, I think, you know, that has been a focus of Polyev is to align with, you know, your average Canadian and and not be all about or trying to at least make it seem like not being all about big business, all those sorts of things, talking about, you know, the everyday Canadian um, and being approachable and wanting good things for everyone, those that sort of message. Um, and and I think it's resonating. I mean, the polls prove it. So it, it's interesting to see just how many shifts are happening, not just generationally. But what's happened is they've branded, they've been successful at branding the liberals as a you know corporate supporting globalist party, you know, being all about climate change and world standards. And you know, they haven't necessarily said they're you know just a bunch of globalists but it, it's it's sort of that's that's sort of the well, and, that's happened. and being out of touch right with with the average family the average challenges of canadians right. i think you know the messaging really has been that the liberals are you know they live in their own little world of ideals and these are also people with you know plenty of their own money that don't really need to be working necessarily right. um and is that really what the average canadian is faced with absolutely not so they have um you know for some time really been sort of ousted as or, or outed as people that aren't in touch and and don't necessarily you know live in the realm of reality of what we're all dealing with and you know we said on the show after the after the caucus meeting that thank god they came out with some like realistic discussions on the economy because they have been this government largely has been accused of sort of being idealistic and pie in the sky and not really paying attention yeah. to what's been really happening in Canada. So I, I, we posted that interview. Of course, you can go back to listen to Wednesday's podcast episode of this show. You can also find the entire interview at realagriculture.com. We talk about the conservatives trying to cater to unions. We talk about the, the, the conservatives view on trade going forward. There's a lot of different stuff that we talk about there with James Moore of Denton. So we're definitely having him back on. Okay, let's get to the gate project. So uh, looking for a serious amount of dollars, ho- over a hundred million to, for Serials Canada ha- to have a, a, a new building, so to speak, to run their, not only their office out of, but also the operational side of market development. And we had Rob Stone. He is with Sask Wheat. He is Sask Wheat's representative on uh, with Serials Canada on the Gate Project uh, Capital 
procurement, I guess, all as unofficial title, as I'm paraphrasing. Um, I asked Rob in an interview, uh, why did Sasquatch make this contribution? Here's what he had to say. It is $6,243,000 in foundational funding to the Gate Project. Um, it's it's a formula within the, the fundraising constructs, and that's that was the request and, that, and the split between the groups. So, um, you know, it, the board has decided to commit that uh, foundational support to, to the project uh, with the expectation that, and several conditions, of course, to it, that all of the other fundraising and other groups and things that will be approached and, and work into the plan over times will fulfill the, the fundraising goal. So um, that was that was the request of our group. And of course, it's the market development, market access, and all of the things that happen is is foundational to to the things that are part of our mandate as well. So this is this is critical. We can't do it as a provincial organization. So we need to be invested in the in the national organization to accomplish this work. So Rob mentions and Rob also farms in David's sketch, and you can hear you've heard him here before on the show in the Farmer Rapid Fire. Um he mentions the word mandate. Okay. And one of the things that I have heard about from our audience and seen a little bit on social media is this question of the mandate. Is this funding, is it actually in farm groups mandate? And I asked Rob, why do you believe that it is? Here's what he had to say. Mandate, market development, market access, all of the activities that Cereals Canada undertakes is, um, is within this project. How we get there, um we need the facility we need the equipment and uh that's fulfilling the roles of taking the research and everything that we do in our in our variety development and marketing it to our international customers so it's it's connecting everything together so i i i believe uh quite confidently that it's well within our mandate that this is something that needs to happen that is Rob Stone. He is on the board of uh, Sasquatch, also Cereals Canada, and appreciate him doing that interview with me uh, late, late <laughs> Thursday night. So uh, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, Kelvin, your thoughts, and then we'll head to break, and we'll get the rest of the panel's thoughts. Well, it is a. I, I think there's been some backlash against this idea. Certainly, the vision I think makes sense, and and you heard Rob's explanation there in terms of they need a new facility. Canada needs. We talked about this earlier in the show. The importance of market development when it comes to India and all these key markets around the world. The importance of that technical support that Canada can provide and has for the last fifty years. So that vision makes sense, but there was still some backlash about the idea of investing producer checkoff dollars from Alberta, Saskatchewan, other provinces in a physical bricks and mortar facility in downtown Winnipeg. Is is that needed? That's, I think, one of the question marks people are asking. And, and that's where the transportation and flights and all those types of factors came, come into the picture. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we have yet to see the end or the full discussion about this funding. And certainly they're getting they're getting 13.4 million now from the provincial grain grower organizations the checkoff orgs across western canada and also some from gfo grain farmers of ontario there's still another 80 some million that needs to be raised to reach the 102 million dollar figure that they are projecting this will all cost and so that's uh, that's something we're going to have to see whether grain industry grain companies government especially steps up with uh, with uh, funding to to reach that amount i know how we're going to get we're going to bet on the oilers this year to win the cup, Marvin. Absolutely. All in, Sean. <laughs> okay. We're going to get uh, some serious reaction to this uh, on top of what Kelvin just said that was serious, uh, besides my poor joke. So we'll, get, we'll do that when we come back. It was like the Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Serious XM. At Vatterstad, we aim to be the world's leading partner for outstanding emergence. We're doing that through innovative tillage, planting, and seeding equipment that's optimized for your field conditions and soil types. We also offer industry-leading capacities to help you get the job done in shorter windows of time. It's all designed to give your crop the best start possible so you can maximize yields. Vatterstat, we look forward to growing together. Featuring dual active ingredients NBPT and pronitridine, Tribune provides consistent protection both above and below ground in one convenient formulation. NBPT defends against ammonia volatilization, while the patented second active ingredient, pronitridine, safeguards nutrients from denitrification and leaching. 
Learn how Tribune can bring greater flexibility and protection to your operation by visiting tribunestabilizer.ca. And welcome back to Real Lag Radio here on Rule Radio 147 at Sirius XM. Nitrogen fertilizer is your farm's number one expense. Farmers are working together through Genesis Fertilizers to solve the problem of high prices and security of supply by planning a state-of-the-art nitrogen plant. Security and earnings through ownership is the solution. Visit Genesis today at genesisfertilizers.com to learn more. We got Marvin Slingerland of MMP, Kelvin Hepner, Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture, along with me, your host, Sean Haney. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, what's your thoughts on, we still got 80 million to go. If, if we do believe it's in the mandate, as Rob explained, uh, government, I guess. How do we get that? So when, and there is some contingency here on, you know, the producer groups ponying up this cash if, um, you know, other money is secured in other ways. So this isn't, you know, handing over of 13.4 million and being like, see ya. Uh, right. So, I mean, there, there is some contingency here to try and, and put this together. And, and honestly, I mean, the board is moving forward with this of Serials Canada, in which case they're going to see this through. It may not happen though. I mean, let's, let's face it. There has to be a certain commitment from uh, likely several levels of government. I'm going to say there's going to have to be still a lot of money procured to put this all together. Um, And realistically, uh, if, you know, the powers that be can't convince everybody that this has to happen, then that money is not forthcoming. And this project does in fact, flop. Um, I, I think that, you know, I see where some of the criticism certainly comes from. And, and let's face it, when it comes to spending dollars from producer groups, um, most producers don't love spending big checks like that. Uh, it's their own money. It's This is why it's important to be involved with your producer group, uh, because ultimately, you know, these are your checkoff dollars that get used and you want to have a say in how it's done. So that's my plug for being involved in your producer groups. Um, it's I mean, we did see some criticism of the bricks and mortar side. There's the potential that this is being built on land that's owned by one of the uh, one of the members. Is that correct? Is that a rumor or is that true? Okay, so that, you know, brings up some potential conflicts of interest that maybe aren't the most comfortable. Uh, But ultimately, I think, you know, I'm glad that we're looking at, you know, how do we address market development? How do we address technical assistance, et cetera? Um, I'm still not entirely convinced that $100 million on bricks and mortar is the way it has to be done. I really do think that there probably could be, I think so, uh, perhaps more efficient ways to do this. And ultimately, that may be what Serials Canada ends up having to do because they do not raise this $102 million dollars like well, if they, they got, can't they want to do something else right? they've got some pull so, in there like i i saw this weekend I, this was news to me but uh, joanne booth former senator yeah. uh mm-hmm. former head of siggy is yep. head of the capital acquisition that's right component yep. of this so who, who has ties in conservative political circles as well which yep. is significant because there could be some urgency yeah. in government yep. funding requests here if uh, if we're going to see a change in federal government and the purse strings get real tight in ottawa uh they may be trying to get that federal commitment before that. Mm-hmm. But if we have former Senator Booth and former head of Siggy, uh, Joanne in, in place there, she has some connections there, which I, to me, that seems yep. quite strategic having her in that role. Yeah. And, and Marvin, I, I think that seems to be the overarching thought about, you know, what a, a change in government is going to mean is a tightening of the purse strings. I, I get the sense that m- not just agriculture, but, several maybe all departments are preparing for this idea that uh we're gonna work on balancing the budget yeah i think that's gonna be a number one priority but i think at the same time a change of government i think the government will be focused on growing the economy as well and i think there would be smart investments smart dollars spent um on this facility on this building i'm really interested in the innovation side of it if they can help develop new markets new products it might just help companies or like Northwest Terminals, like could a producer group work closely with Innovation Hub and develop their own little niche market and mm-hmm. make it successful? That's that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, good thought. Okay, uh, Federal Reserve, because Kelvin loves to talk economics and we're going to geek out for a second. The Federal Reserve, some are saying Ooh, it just waited way too long, but uh, made a, you know, put a pretty big number on the board, 50 basis point drop in in their key lending rate. 
this this week, and it's the first rate cut in four years. It lowers the target range from the federal funds rate by, like I said, fifty basis points from four and three quarter to it's a range from four and three quarter to five. And there's a lot of concern now about the U.S. economy, Kelvin. And that uh, honestly, I think that uh, creates a lot of concern for countries that rely on the U.S. economy to be strong. Yeah, certainly here in, in Canada as well. And I, yeah, thanks for indulging me. But I on in in talking about this, but I, I think this is also something that a lot of people, especially business owners who are borrowing large amounts of money, they don't mind hearing that uh, interest rates are, are going to be dropping at least in the U.S. here by fifty basis points. Canada has been ahead of uh, the U.S. in terms of uh, dropping its its key lending rate, although. Now this brings up questions about whether the Bank of Canada and its next decision is going to have a, a larger drop. We're still expecting a couple more cuts in, in Canada as well before the end of the year here. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Some more signs of weakness on the demand side. That's not good. Uh, and, and at the same time, if we were expecting a correction at all in uh, land prices and some of the other uh, markets, we haven't really seen much of that here and interest rates are dropping again. And so uh, that's uh, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that this means our land market isn't going to cool off any more than it uh, has here over the last year or two with uh, with rates. Being I'm there too. Somewhat high. Yeah. I, I I I've been I'm looking forward to what the FCC land value report is this year because I I don't think it's uh, it's going to be as weak as some people think. I think it's going to be strong. I think the higher rates as and, and we're calling them high by historical standards, not really that high. But higher than what we've been used to the last couple last decade or so, uh, yeah, I, I think they didn't stretch out long enough in terms of if we were hoping to, if somebody was wanting to see a correction or cooling off in the land market, I, I'm not sure that that effect will have been reached here yet. Yeah, Marvin, what do you think? Yeah, two months ago I would have said we're going to see a little cooling off in land prices, but with the last few rate cuts, um, what I've seen is more optimism again in land purchases and even. When I was out in Ontario last week, it was the same conversation there. Land prices are still strong, still strong in Alberta, the prairies. And yeah, I'm looking forward to that report as well, Sean, because I'm pretty sure it's going to be another uh, high increase. If if you have capital to put somewhere, it has been the best place yeah. to do it. Like, yeah. you, you can invest in tech startups and you can put money in your RSP, but land has been the place to put capital and it's just it hasn't been as sensitive to market fluctuations as say like you know land in iowa stuff like that it's just it's yeah it's just been way more it just feels like it's been way more stable sorry go ahead Kevin. i was just going to say it's it's great for all everybody who owns it is already invested and has it as an asset i'm curious and this is something i think some people spend a lot of time thinking about way more than what i have but uh the amount what what's the long term impact on the longevity of, or sustainability of our industry if young farmers have don't have a way of, of purchasing? I guess we we're, it, it means that we have to see an evolution in in farming models, I believe. And yeah, more renters. We're continuing to see yeah. that unfold here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, uh, have yourselves a great weekend, Lindsay. Enjoy that nice summer that that nice summer weather you're getting. Yeah. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Kelvin, all the best to you. Thank you. Take care, all. Hey, thanks a lot for being here, Marvin. Really appreciate it. You bet. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay. Now, I, whatever you heard today, I know you probably agreed with some of it, disagreed with others. We want to get your perspective. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or, of course, you can call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you so much for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. Make sure you go to realagriculture.com over the weekend, and we'll talk to you again on Monday. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this episode brought to you by Brett Young. Check out their new BY7204LL canola with pod defender shatter tolerance and defender rated club root protection. Talk to your local retailer today.